And thank you again for speaking with us today, Secretary Chu. Uh, we have numerous and high quality questions from our audience today, and, and please feel free to keep them coming in. Um, our first question from the audience, um, it, during his 2008 presidential campaign, uh, President, now President Obama referred to a new energy economy as my number one priority. In the past two years, Congress has passed health care reform. Uh, financial reform has also passed. The stimulus bill passed. An energy bill didn't pass. Are you disappointed? Well, of course I'm disappointed. Um, and, but I think the thing is that, um, you know, we're here now. Let's, I'm, I don't think there's a lot of uh, good that can be coming of saying I'm disappointed, therefore what? Therefore, you stop trying? No. I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, the United States can re recognize the economic opportunity that uh, virtually all of Europe, Western Europe has recognized, and developed countries in Asia have recognized, and the developing countries around the world are beginning to recognize. And I think this is, it's so important. America, I am optimistic, will wake up and seize the opportunity, and when it does, it still has the greatest innovation machine in the world. Much of your strategy for solving the climate change problem, such as setting the economic stage for the embrace of nuclear and carbon capture and storage, for example, is based for an, a price on carbon. It's based on having a price. Now that it is looking almost impossible for Congress to pass something like that, which would set a price on carbon, are you concerned the economics for fixing the climate are now impossible? Well, I think the price will be based on carbon eventually worldwide, uh, and we're going to go forward with what we can do now. Um, now, having said that, it is certainly true carbon capture and storage, uh, if you have a stationary uh, emitter like a coal plant, a, a gas plant, a cement plant, um, it, to the immediate micro cost of that industry, it will always cost more to capture the carbon and store it. Uh, that's equivalent to saying that if you're a city, and uh, you get into an abstract debate as to whether you want to treat the sewage or just dump it into the river, uh, the immediate lowest cost is to jump, dump in the river. It's cheaper for you, but it's not cheaper for the city downstream. And so the total integrated costs of the effects of doing this are much, much cheaper if you say, no, it's better to treat it at the source and eliminate that. And so we, this is why there should be a price on carbon. Nuclear, I think, you know, we're still hopeful that it actually uh, can get to be cost effective if you can show that it can be built on time, on schedule, that um, it can hold its own. But, but also remember that one of the drivers we're trying in wind and solar and all these other technologies is we think it can be cheaper than fossil fuel. What is DOE's role in the international meetings on climate change that began today in Cancun? Can the U.S. meet the pledges it made in Copenhagen? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I think um, <coughs> the answer is yes, of, of course we can. I think it requires, uh, again, bipartisan will and support to do this. Um, now, I'm, um, as pointing out, would, was I the geek or the nerd? I forget. Or something like that. But in any case, uh, my task and the Department of Energy's task is to develop and nurture uh, the technologies to help industry go in the right direction and help them nurture those technologies. Because in the end, uh, when push comes to shove, when the rubber hits the road, uh, this is what's going to allow us to do what we have to do. I think the intro and the clips have you as a self-described geek. Are you, are you sticking with that assessment? Sure, I'll stick with that. <laughs> For many years, uh, U.S. graduate programs in the hard sciences have drawn large numbers of foreign students, and U.S. innovation has benefited. Um, changes to U.S. immigration policy post-9-11 and rising economic opportunity in home countries are leading more such students to return home after earning their degrees. What can the U.S. do to offset this trend and its consequences for U.S. innovation? Well, one of the uh, recommendations of rising above the Gavin Storm, but also many, many reports, is that uh, when a student comes to the United States, gets a PhD in science and engineering, and does well, staple a green card next to the diploma. Um, <laughs> uh, because in actual fact, what happens in graduate education in science and engineering in the United States is, is that grants pay for it. The United States is investing in these people. 
And if they do well, uh, you do not want to encourage that investment to go back. Uh, so, and you're quite right. Um, uh, things are changing. Uh, they come to the United States to get an education. Why? Because the research universities in the United States still are the best in the world, bar none, and that's recognized. But if they come here, get an education, get a PhD, do a postdoc, and then go back as a young person, then we in the United States have lost a great deal. Um, it's also pointed out in Rising Above the Gathering Storm Revisited that uh, the majority now of grad people getting PhDs in science and engineering are now foreign born. Uh, now the good news, there's always some good news in this. The good news is that if I look across the country in the last three or four years especially, the young people are waking up to the energy and climate change problem, and that is drawing them into science, just as in my day, this little 184 pound thing going beep, beep, beep across the United States said, ooh, maybe I should go into science and engineering. So the young kids now want to go back into this. This is a good sign. And so I think you know, it's important that the government federal government, the state governments recognize this is a good sign, take advantage of it, because in the end, this will be a cornerstone for our economic prosperity. Just before this program began, we started seeing news reports that President Obama may shortly be announcing a pay freeze for federal employees. One of the issues that DOA has been attracting top-notch scientific talent. Um, are you aware of any discussion of a federal pay freeze, and, and how does such an action affect your efforts to recruit quality scientists? Well, I'm aware of an action, um, and we'll see how that unfolds, because this ultimately has to be also approved by Congress. So we'll see how it unfolds. But I think um, in terms of the ability to attract quality people into the DOE, uh, surprisingly, a number of people have been willing to take cuts in pay, cuts in pay, factor of two, four, ten, to live in a, a fishbowl, if you will, uh, because they feel it's that important. And so Arun, for example, was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences, engineering rather, when he was 42 or 43. Uh, he's still in his 40s. He had to resign from UC Berkeley in order to come work for the government. So he gave up a tenure position. So it's not as though he were, well, science is losing its gas, and you know, it's better years behind him, might as well work for the government. No, he was entering into uh, his incredible years of high productivity, and we've got a bunch of others like that. So it's tough, and you have to be kind of a little bit crazy and a whole lot patriotic, but we can still get some people. Some Republicans in Congress have intimated that they may try to rescind some Recovery Act funds. What would that mean for the Energy Department and your efforts? Well, I hope, uh, I hope they don't. I, I, I think that uh, these, these are Recovery Act funds in the Department of Energy are an important down payment uh, to what we have to do. And, uh, the, and then the real question, as I posed in my talk, was uh, certainly after Recovery Act, you can't spend at that rate. And we're looking very hard at how we can use our precious resources going into the future um, in order to go forward. And again, I, I think this fundamentally is a bipartisan slash nonpartisan issue. It's, it's all about economic prosperity. Also, among the new majority, Republican majority in the House are several um, fairly vocal climate change skeptics. Um, given the increasingly vocal voices on the climate change debate and criticism of climate change science. Do you anticipate that you will be going back to fighting the climate change debate itself rather than pushing for solutions to it? Well, well, I hope not. I, I think um, that if anything over the last half dozen years the evidence has gotten more compelling. But the issue, because I think sometimes you get a little bit sideways on this debate if you say, have you proven with 100 percent certainty that this is happening and some bad things, as you, what you say, what the climate scientists are saying, are happening. And I, I maintain you don't need 100% certainty. You know, 80, 90%, uh, and maybe of half the bad things that happened with 80 or 90% certainty is enough to say, okay, how do you want to plant your personal life? Let me use this as an analogy. You just bought a home, 
Electrician comes in and says, you know, the wiring's shot. It's frayed. You got to replace the wiring. It's going to cost. How much is it going to cost? Fifteen thousand dollars. Well, you're strapped. You just bought the house. How can you replace the wiring for fifteen thousand dollars? So what do you do? You get another estimate. Okay, another. I'm sorry. I, you know, I said, well, I don't know, but the next new electrician says, you got to do it because it's going to be bad if you don't. Okay, do you shop around for the one in a thousand electricians who say it's okay? <laughs> Not really. Do you, do, you, uh, do you actually go and you say, well, okay, that's a threat, but I think it's more cost effective. I just make sure my fire insurance is up to date. You know, your family's living in the home. It could burn down while they're asleep. You bite the bullet and say, I'm going to do this. Okay? But it isn't even that. In, what I'm trying to tell the American public is that this is an economic opportunity, so it's not even though you're, 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 you have to make this ex expenditure. You're making uh, an expenditure because in the long run, for the future, future economic health of the country, and that future is not 20 years in the future. We're talking one, two, three years. You got to make these investments. You addressed China and its own alternative energy development uh, in, in your remarks. Many of the new green technologies that you mentioned depend on rare earth materials whose mining and processing China now dominates. What research or development is the Energy Department pursuing to develop U.S. capacity to produce either those rare earth materials or alternatives to them? Uh, <clears throat> all of the above. I think uh, that was a wake-up call that if you depend on a single supplier with China, um, producing roughly 95 or more percent of the rare earths around the world, and you have a single supplier uh, that you run a risk. And so uh, there has been a, a mine in, in California that's been shut down, and we're in discussions with that mine to help, help them start up again. Uh, there are a number of, of forays. Rare earths are not that rare, um, and, and but is at stake, however, is that uh, you have to be very careful on how to mine them, so how to mine them in an environmentally responsible way, and so we're working on that. Uh, many other countries have gotten concerned and are looking at other, other places for supply, at, but we're also going deeper than that. We're also looking at ways to use them more efficiently, but also techno technological ways to get the same benefit of the rare earths, and it depends on you know, whether it's used in electronics for very high efficiency motors or in uh, displays for flat screen TVs and a number of things, looking at alternative substitutes because what has happened is in some of these rare earths, the price has gone up by tenfold. And that in itself is worrisome. And so we are doing a lot in terms of exactly what you say, looking for substitutes. Also on the topic of energy independence, um, you do a lot of work with the USDA, um, especially on ethanol projects, with a focus on next generation fuels, cellulosic ethanol forms of, of, of that production. Uh, this uh, December 31st, there is a tariff and a subsidy for corn-based ethanol that are up for, for expiration. This question from the audience asks, do corn ethanol subsidies still need to occur, and do trade protections for corn-based ethanol need to continue um, in the current energy climate? Well, let me, let, me, let me just say that um, what the Department of Energy, you know, because this is, this is a complicated economic issue as well, and what the Department of Energy, as you said, is focusing on is, you know, corn-based ethanol is a good way of getting it going, realizing that Americans can drive their vehicles uh, using agriculture-based uh, fuels. But we are primarily focused, as you noted, on developing the new technologies that can supersede uh, ethanol made from starches, sugars, like corn. But we're also focusing on ways that we can actually go beyond ethanol. Uh, ethanol is not an ideal transportation fuel. Uh, gasoline, jet fuel, kerosene, mostly kerosene is in jet fuel, and diesel fuel are much better uh, things to use. They don't require changing the infrastructure. And so one of the things we are focusing very much on is how do you take biofuels but make 
direct substitutes for these fuels that can be stuck and blended in any ratio directly into the gas tank. And let me just add that because of this, we've actually started some, I think four years ago, before my time when I was director of LBNL, three bioenergy research centers on the same rubric as these energy hubs, get a whole bunch of really smart people, say, go, you, this is your, your task, come up with dramatically new technologies. And within six months after the start of one of these centers, they took uh, E. coli, a simple bacteria that you find in the gut of your stomach, and put in whole new metabolic pathways so that when you feed E. coli sugars, they will actually produce direct substitutes for gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. When they reported this discovery in Nature magazine, I called up the director of this, who is a friend of mine, because I had some role in helping this thing get going. He said, okay, Jay, that's great. What do you need to make it commercially viable at pick a price? So any price, $80 a barrel. He said, well, it's gotta be within 80% of what we think is the organism can produce, and we're not there yet, uh, and sugar has to be this price. But by then, by the time it got published, a, a private company has already picked it up and is running with it, tried to optimize it. And the scientists who did the basic research are saying, you know, this, this could actually work. We can find out in a year or two. So let's do a little benchtop prototype production thing to see what are the things we need to figure out. So again, the, uh, the idea that you got really, really smart people trying to solve a problem, not just publish a paper, is a is, is the way we've got to go. And so we see lots of good evidence of that coming along. This is sort of a mashup of two questions, which is always dangerous to ask, but we'll give it a go here. Um, both questions from the audience. The administration has indicated a desire to pursue development of nuclear, but also a position against dumping spent fuel at Yucca Mountain. How off the table is the Yucca project? And assuming that it is, how does the administration plan to deal the lingering issue of nuclear waste store disposal as it's giving out billions of dollars of loan credit guarantees to, to nuclear projects? Well, first, um, there's two things. First, we, we believe that it's the right and proper thing to do to restart the American nuclear industry. Uh, we believe that uh, this is not only good for going to uh, uh, decrease our carbon emissions, but we also think this is good technologically, it's good for us economically. Uh, the United States used to be the leader in this, but uh, it's again one of those things we've lost the lead in. The leadership is now in France, it's in Japan, it's in Korea. And now China uh, is going in such a big way that it has plans to build four nuclear foundries for the castings uh, in China. Um, I think the problem of the nuclear waste is a problem that actually fundamentally, I think, can be solved. It, it, but it, it's both a scientific problem and a political problem. The political problem is you've got to engage very, very early and make it, the people in the area want, to, want it to happen. Uh, and, and you might say, well, how can that be? And we actually have an existence proof. Um, there's a low-level waste repository that we run in New Mexico. Initially, the people were a little bit worried about this because they're worried, you know, this is, in, this is, so you stick the stuff under the ground in a salt formation. It has um, a disadvantage, but once you stick it on, you, you mine down to the salt formation. The salt formation has been proven to be stable for tens of millions of years. So even though in that time the continents are drifting around, this is okay. You can radioactively date that. And so the downside is, after you stick it in, the salt oozes around it and encapsulates it, and you can't get back at it. Well, that wasn't the original requirements at Yucca. This is actually what you want. Don't you want it to kind of ooze around and you can't get back at it? So, uh, so the thing has been operating now for 10 years. It's, it, there's been no accidents. It's been done very safely. It's an income generation for the communities around it. And so I think it, one has to do that. But So the story has two parts to it. One is that there may be better strategies, better ways of approaching it, and that's why there's this Blue Ribbon Commission that's looking into this, that the Nuclear Regulatory Agency has already said that we can keep 
the storage where it is now in dry cast storage for 50, perhaps even 100 plus years. So the commission's task is tell us technically what we should be doing. It's not a siting commission, but tell us technically what are the best options, what type of storage do you want. It could be a dual thing. It could be interim plus permanent disposal. It could be lots of things. They're f free to decide what to do, knowing, but knowing that you have 50 years that it, we're not in a crisis situation. And so we can do a much better job this time. And, and so that's the task of the commission. Now, having said that, and this is the, the realization that it's solvable, would you say, let's not do anything for in the next 50 years <laughs> until we prove? No, not really. Uh, there's lots of things we say, OK, if we think about it, this is, this is going to work. We know it's going to work. Let's move ahead and then restart our nuclear industry. And uh, again, it's, it's, it's important also the United States restart, not only for the economic issues, but also for the nonproliferation issues. The United States uh, is still one of the leaders in, in fighting for nonproliferation, and the fact that if we're a player in the civilian nuclear industry, that will help us a lot as well. And so there's a variety of reasons, both economic, world peace, a lot of reasons why I think we should become players. One topic that has not been discussed in great detail today has been energy efficiency. Um, what do you see as some of the most promising initiatives in that area that DOE or other researchers may be pursuing? Well, um, yes, energy efficiency. I'm so glad you raised this. Uh, it is, I'm, as you may know, I'm often fond of saying it is the lowest hanging fruit. It is not only low hanging fruit, but it is actually uh, something that we are pushing very, very strongly. Kathy Zoy, who's uh, the uh, Assistant Secretary for EERE, Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy, now acting Undersecretary for the Energy Section of the Department of Energy, is here. And we're uh, pushing very hard to show that you can actually, energy efficiency means saving money. And if it really means saving money, then it's, uh, then it should, this is something that should be, uh, should f happen by itself. So it isn't happening by itself. Why isn't it happening? You look at the things, whether it's uh, capital and initial investments, whether it's ignorance, whether it's a lot of things, habits, uh, to change that. But we, we do firmly believe that energy efficiency is the fastest, quickest way to make us more competitive, save money that would go into our pockets, that will go back into the economy, many, many things, uh, and it's ultimately going to be saving uh, lots of dollars and lots of carbon. So, so these, this energy efficiency is something very big, especially, you know, you think of cars, you, we can do better there, but buildings is a very big deal. Uh, we think you can build a building that can decrease the energy consumption of a building by a factor of four in ways that would pay for itself so that it pays for itself in, let's say, a quarter of the lifetime of the building. And we start an innovation hub to actually show that you can design these using computer-aided design, that uh, it can be built in, in new buildings, especially retrofits may be a factor of two, and demonstrate that if you do this, you actually save money. And once you begin to demonstrate this, we hope it just takes off by itself because all of a sudden you realize it. However, there's something that you have to be very conscious of. You have to be willing, for the first point, factor of two, just a better design, no more additional money. Okay? Just know, know the current technology that exists today and you're right off the bat, no additional money, you're saving energy. The next factor, too, will require additional investments and the question is, are you willing to invest in the lifetime of a 60-year building to get a payback time in 10 years? If you say no, then you can't do some of those things, okay? And, and so that's something that, uh, you know, investing in the long term is uh, one of the issues that we have to overcome in, in, in our thinking of investments. 
We are almost out of time, but before asking the last question, we have a couple of important matters to take care of. First, to remind our members and guests of future speakers. On December 2nd, we have Mukhtar Kent, the chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, and our first luncheon of 2011 will be on January 12th, where Gail McGovern, head of the American Red Cross, will discuss one year after the Haiti earthquake, progress and challenges. would also like to present our speaker in commemoration and appreciation of his time today with the National Press Club mug. Thank you. <laughs> and I know we're running a little bit over time today, but for our audience's enjoyment and to get a better sense of Stephen Chu the man, we have one final question. Um, so you have a PhD in, in oh, excuse me, you have your PhD, you have your Nobel Prize in physics, you're leading a cabinet department. A lot of people would come with the assumption that you're pretty smart. Um, <laughs> As many of us know, having lived and worked in Washington for some time, we know there's a lot of people in Washington who maybe aren't so smart. Um, present company accepted, please. How does the Secretary of Energy and a Nobel laureate deal with people who just don't get it in Washington? First, um, please tell my mother that I'm smarter than she thinks. <laughs> no, um, I, I don't think uh, you go into any job w with an attitude like that. Uh, uh, you know, I was a professor for many, many years, <laughs> and uh, and my attitude always. And when I was working at Bell Labs, sometimes I would have an idea of management. I'd go and talk to them. I want to do this. They kind of look at me. No, and my my reaction was constantly okay. Not, oh, I'm smart and they, therefore, you know, what's going on? They say, okay, I went back and I said, hmm, what didn't I explain right? <laughs> and then we'd go back and say, okay, this is what I think. Now, once I went back three times and, and uh, my then boss's boss kind of looked at me and he says, um, Steve, if you're going to argue about wanting to do that experiment, I got better things to do. <laughs> He had actually let me do it, but never mind. <laughs> he wasn't thrilled, but but I always come in with the attitude that uh, if you don't if you don't succeed the first time, try again. You something you know, or they can try to convince you they're right. That's part of this discussion. You know, I could be wrong, okay? And so uh, so you get this give and take. Now, the, the final part of this, you know, this guy turned out to be a very good friend of mine that I've known for 35 years now, 32 years, uh, and he's now in the Department of Energy. He's the director of the Office of Science. <laughs> so he forgave me. <laughs> well, thank you, Secretary Chu, and thank you to the staff of the National Press Club, and thank you to the staff of the Energy Department that scrambled in the PowerPoint situation, and thank you all for coming here today. This meeting of the National Press Club is adjourned.